do jutra, jaz sem se lepo pozdravljal in na ta lep sončen jesenski dan. Zahvaljujem, da se vam za ta lep opisk. In glede na to, da je to prvo predavanje v seriji predavanj, ki jih organiziramo v sodelovanju z jaznim veliposlaništvom v Ljubljani, bi najprej pa sodelo excelenco jaznega veliposlanika, gospoda Majsa Irena, tu dati predvorovanje. Your Excellency, please, a few words. Thank you, Professor Steger. It's a great pleasure to join you here this morning for a lecture, which I hope will uh, show the, um, the, uh, the roots, the origins of the, the, the relationship between Ireland and the Western Balkans, um, which is um, you know, historic, but also um, contemporary. Um, this year is the centenary of Irish diplomats heading out from uh, Ireland to uh, engage with the world. Uh, they, they went out with uh, some great optimism at the time, uh, hearing uh, the uh, 14 points of President Wilson uh, with some anticipation that perhaps the larger countries would uh, give them a hearing. Uh, they had a greater expectation that perhaps smaller countries would, but they were somewhat disappointed by that. Um, but we continued on over that century and it's, uh, we contrast that situation with the situation today where Ireland has, is now a member of the European Union and is, has been shown solidarity by both large and smaller countries in the challenge that we face in relation to Brexit. Um, the Embassy is very pleased to uh, support this um, lecture this morning and a number of other lectures uh, in that context of the centenary of uh, 1919. Again, it's both historical and also a way to develop the relationship, the contemporary relationship between universities in Ireland and in uh, Slovenia. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you. So the introduction will already be in English. <laughs> so it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Malashevich and a great honor to have with Simon Ljubljana. Um, Sinisha is a professor at University College Dublin. I'm not going to go through his entire list of academic achievements. What I do want to highlight that you might not know is that his book, Sociology of War and Violence, is the one textbook used in Sociology of War courses. Um, and his more recent book, Rise of Organized Brutality, won the American Sociological Association Award for an outstanding book. He'll today, I understand, be talking more about uh, some findings from his most recent book, um, which, if you are a nationalism scholar, just reading through John Burley, Miguel Centeno, Randall Collins, Michael Mann, and Andreas Wimmer are basically the five key people in nationalism studies who have all written about what a great contribution this is to um, our knowledge about nationalism and our academic pursuit of understanding how nationalism works. Um, so this is undoubtedly going to be a great book in the canons of nationalism studies. And before I turn over um, the word to Sinisha, I also wanted to say that he's also an amazing scholar and friend. Um, I first met him in 2010 when he actually had a debate with um, Anthony Smith on the future of nationalism. So it was the two of them at London School of Economics debating on where nationalism studies were going, um, a historical moment, I would say, within where nationalism studies are going. At this point, I was just beginning my PhD studies, and Sinisha sat on with me for two hours to help me figure out where the dissertation was going, how to help organize it. And this is something that, for more established scholars, is very, I would say, rare to actually actively help junior scholars of nationalism, like myself. So um, again, a great honor and pleasure to have you in Ghana, and we're very much looking forward to it. Thank you.
also go back very much to thank the Irish Embassy and the Ambassador for uh, supporting this. And I think this is a wonderful thing, making Slovenian uh, scholars and Slovenian universities with Irish universities. And it's very unusual for me to be sort of represent Ireland here in a, in a place which used to be part of the country that where I was born. <laughs> so, so that's maybe a nice kind of uh, touch to the whole thing. So what I wanted to do, and I think, uh, thanks Tamara very much for your kind words. <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to do today, and, and Rob basically suggested that I do something, you know, kind of linking Ireland with uh, Irish nationalism in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, with the experience of this part of the world, broadly speaking. I obviously won't be talking about Slovenia, and geographically Slovenia is not part of the Balkans, so although it has been influenced by these states to some extent. So my focus will largely be on the states that emerged from the past of Ottoman empires, Serbia, Bulgaria, uh, Greece, uh, Romania to some extent, looking at these movements uh, and how they relate to Irish experience. Uh, however, my focus as a historical sociologist will be on, on a kind of more, 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 more theoretical themes, but we will be looking at these empirical cases to make a sort of a particular theoretical point. Uh, so if you look at the, the you know, both of these uh, uh, historical experiences, the Balkan one and the Irish one, the conventional, the conventional narrative, the historical narrative that one finds in you know, textbooks of history, you know, the official discourses that are uh, perpetuated by you know, official channels, official institutions, uh, they tend to be presented as very similar in terms of being a quite typical representatives of the 19th century movements of small nation, uh, fighting this great mighty empire. So in one case, this is the Ottomans, to some extent, uh, Habsburgs, uh, Habsburgs, the Hungarian one, uh, and the British, obviously, in an Irish case. So in, in, in this narrative, nationalism and imperialism are very much depicted as a two mutually opposing ideologies and uh, uh, organizational projects, where it's very clear uh, what small nation is. Small nation is a victim. And big empires is obviously powerful and mighty and dark in some respect related to our conquest and everything else. Uh, how, I, I mean, if you look at the, the sort of a, a historiographical interpretation of this uh, relationship between nation and empire and nationalism and imperialism, uh, we could see that a lot of the kind of research in the 20th century, second half of the 20th century, was very much uh, built around that narrative that. It's, one can distinguish very clearly what an empire is, what a nation is, and that nationalism and imperialism have nothing in common. Uh, one of the leading German historians, uh, Lockheed Lonson, in his uh, Theories of Imperialism book, uh, was very explicit, saying that the age of imperialism is dead, it's buried, now we live only in the world of nation states, and nationalism is really the only remaining ideology, the only dominant form of political legitimacy. Which, in some respect, it's the second part of this uh, argument makes sense, although the first part is something that I will challenge. Then, more recently, another great uh, historian, Eric Hobsbawm, uh, made more or less the same statement in, in a book. I think this was probably his last book. It was published after he placed that. Uh, where, where he said, there is no prospect of return to the imperial world. The age of empires is dead. Uh, so we, we can say that this has been and still remains uh, a kind of staple of, of these conventional narratives. Uh, uh, however, more recently, we see changes within history, but also within historical sociology, which problematize this dichotomy. We essentially uh, want to, to show that there is really much more ambiguity, historical ambiguity, in, in terms of how uh, uh, this uh, process of nation uh, formation and imperial uh, uh, discourses developed, uh, and there's actually much more continuity between the two than previously recognized, both in terms of organizational structure and also in terms of ideological uh, uh, discourses. So, what did I write? <laughs> Before we start, 
side to this, it's also important to differentiate between ancient empires that John Paul and Patricia Brown and a few other scholars have called capstone empires because of the nature of how they were organized and uh, their, their inability to penetrate much of their uh, territory in their society. Uh, so they, they have really developed uh, very well despotic uh, powers but very uh, weak infrastructural capacity. Uh, so here we are talking about the Roman Empire or Chinese Empire, which are obviously the, the strongest of these traditional capstone empires, but many other satellites in that and so on. And we, we should distinguish between these kind of early empires and, and more modernizing empires from the 18th, 19th century, where we see a uh, uh, profound change in the sense that these entities are quite different uh, in the sense that they experience both imperial expansion like British French, uh, Dutch, uh, and so on, and they were also nationalizing at home at the same time. So what you see, let's say, in French uh, uh, context is, is from French Revolution onward, is a lot of uh, internal nationalizing, turning these uh, peasants into French men and women, while at the same time expanding in the world as an empire. So the two uh, somehow develop simultaneously, and that's also the case of the British and others. Uh, so from in the last decade or so, we have lots of books and articles which tease out this, this kind of, these the two links. One of the early articles uh, written by uh, uh, Krish, Krishna Kumar, a friend of mine, who's a, a really good historical sociologist, where he uh, develops challenges this dichotomy. He said, empires and nation states might be, in fact, uh, just alternative projects which are available for elites to pursue depending on the circumstances of the moment. Then we, we see something similar in another book published at the same time by Urban Cooper, looking at a cognitive analysis of empires. And Kumar has also recently published a really good book, Visions of Empire, where he compares uh, a, a British, French, a Russian, uh, uh, I don't know, five empires basically, looking at the similarities. It's a really good book. Uh, and Urban Cooper's book, which is also cognitive analysis of empire, shows that there are a lot of these kind of similarities in terms of how sovereignty <coughs> not only conceptualized, but how it's shared out, layered overlapping in both in some nation states and these late empires. Then we have a kind of very recent scholarship on uh, the US by Julian Gold and others, uh, where uh, he focuses on, on, on British uh, nation state, and British, uh, the US uh, nation state, and tries to show how they, they can be and are simultaneously both empires and uh, large nation states. And he shows how the two you know, use uh, and shift be between nationalism and imperialism. Uh, he looks at some commonalities between the two. First of all, that they both deny that they are empires, and I think that's also one of the key features of modern world, world where we live, which is dominated by nation state, that nobody wants to be an empire. This was something which is very different in the 19th century, when the being uh, an empire was, was considered to be a good, positive thing, you are the beacon of civilization and things like that. So they tend to deny that, uh, and then they shift between nationalism and imperialism, uh, and his argument that this is much more visible in the, in the periods of political weakness, and, and, uh, where, where this is much more pronounced, and so on. Uh, so all of this scholarship is really good, it's interesting, it challenges these conventional understandings of the two, but it tends to overemphasize big, powerful states. So there's a lot, a lot of research on the US, there's a, there's a really good book, I don't know if any of you have read, uh, by Michael Mann uh, from 2005, in Coherent Empire, where he also compares the US uh, with previous centers, British and French, uh, uh, looking at the military uh, capacity, looking at the ideological power, looking at economic and cultural influence, and then develops an argument that the US is not a coherent empire because it's, it has an even power. So it's militarily an empire, but it's not so much of an empire in terms of economy. Uh, and in, the, in terms of ideology and other, other factors. Uh, so this research tends to focus generally on these powerful states like the United States, like Russia or China, uh, and has less to say about what's happening uh, with, with other entities in the world, with uh, kind of more marginal regions, with less influential states. Uh, what we can see, is there any, anything there that we can use and, and make this argument about kind of links between empires and nation states and imperialism and nationalism. So that's one problem. The second problem is they tend to focus too much on the present time, which in some respect 
is, is uh, uh, expected because these are, uh, you know, a lot of the people in sociology and social science tend to focus more, much more recent times. And uh, what, what's more interesting is look at these long-term legacies between materials and nationalism. And that's what I want to do in today's talk to address these two uh, problems, I think, that exist. So by looking largely at, at these examples of violent involvements. So again, to go back to what I was saying initially, uh, the, the conventional narrative of the 19th century is a simple narrative, that nationalism trumps imperialism, that empires scramble and nation states rise, that uh, you know, nations become emancipated and, uh, you know, from these shackles of the imperial uh, order. Uh, and if you look at the Irish case, a lot of, kind of Irish historiography identifies specific moments in time as playing this decisive role in the rise of Irish nationalism from the Fenian uprising in 1867, uh, the Fenian dynamite campaign in 1867-85. Obviously, this was after the invention of dynamite, uh, and, and which played an important part in the rise of different social movements. Anarchists, first of all, the nationalists, even suffragettes had some. Uh, bombing experience in, in this period. Uh, then we have the land war from 1879 as an important historical moment. Uh, then uh, Irish national invisible assassinations from 1813, uh, and ultimately culminating in the 1916 Easter Rising, which initially was a failure because the uh, rebels or the revolutionaries were arrested and some killed. Uh, most essentially ended up being in prison or killed. But because of the way how British uh, uh, treated uh, these revolutionaries, initially there was no support in Ireland, not much support for the rising, but after the, uh, these events, uh, you know, the, the, the popular opinion changed completely and it was much more uh, moving in that direction of uh, uh, pro independence and things like that. So, what we see in these kind of narratives, uh, traditional narratives, is a very kind of classical typical understanding that there is a small nation, Ireland, fighting in this mighty British Empire. <coughs> a similar narrative is, is also present in much of uh, historiography in the Balkans, uh, that you have this uh, small Balkan nations challenging the imperial power of Ottoman Empire, Habsburgs uh, later on as well, and the focus is again on some key moments in the Serbian uprisings, first and second Serbian uprising, uh, in the early 20th, early 19th century, then kind of very bloody uh, Greek War of Independence from 1821 to 29. Even though this war was not really uh, a lot of the most important uh, uh, groups who fought in that war were not Greek, but it was great powers, British, French, others, uh, Ottomans as well. But it's it's an important moment, obviously, in Greek uh, national narrative. Then the Romanian unification, 1859. Uh, and then obviously the Berlin Congress of 1878, uh, when lots of these states uh, were officially recognized Serbia, Romania, Montenegro, and Bulgaria later on also became independent fully. Uh, oh, okay, so this is a, this conventional narrative which I want to challenge. Uh, so what's important for us is really not to take these things for granted and to look at these some the complexities of this historical process to look at the way how imperial and national were not really uh, often uh, oppo opposed to each other, but were very, very much often underpinning each other. So you, what I will argue is that 19th and early 20th century, uh, you see that a lot of these small nation movements have uh, uh, drawn equally on the national and imperial concepts, imperial legacies, uh, imperial experience, uh, and in order to legitimize their calls for uh, independence and for the existence of sovereign states. So this is not obviously unique to Ireland or the Balkans. This is something which is much more visible and obvious uh, with many states. Let's say Portugal, Portuguese nationalism is very much has historically been built around the notion of Portugal as a former empire that conquered you know, a lot of Latin America, parts of Africa and so on, although the empire uh, was gone earlier, it, it, you know, this, this heritage, the imperial heritage is still involved. It's still part of a Portuguese nationalist uh, discourse. We see that in Denmark, which is often referred to as this great small nation, uh, which used to be an empire as well, and then lost uh, the territory to Germany, 
but it, it, it remained, you know, it fit at Faroe Islands and uh, Greenland and, and things like that, which and maintained that legacy of the imperial past, involving this imperial past in the name of Danish nationalism. We could see that in Sweden to some extent, which used to be an empire as well, uh, Lithuania, the Lithuanian Polish Commonwealth, Armenia, Georgia, all of these had some sort of an imperial past that they could use in order to make a nationalist claim. So imperialism and nationalism here were not, uh, 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 you know, a, 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 a clash, were not clashing, but they were very much uh, developing in parallel. So now we'll take a look at how this really developed in the context of a Balkan and Irish experience. Uh, there are some obviously differences here, but there are also some similarities. Uh, well, one of the key differences is that Balkan nationalism was very much built around that idea of a great nation, uh, or great, greater Bulgaria, greater Serbia, greater Greece, and so on. While the Irish nationalism tend to be built very much around the notion of a small nation, uh, but we will see how this developed and why it developed the way it did. So the conventional narratives, again, if you look at the historiography and textbooks in, in the Balkans, which themselves are very nationalist, uh, they tend to speak of nationalist revolutions that took place in the 19th century, where people were you know, finally given opportunity to be Serbs and independent and Bulgarians and Greeks. Uh, but actually, if you look, if you do proper research and read you know, kind of how things actually where you see there was, there was very little nationalism in that period, between the early 19th century, because overwhelming majority of the population were illiterate peasants, whose sense of identity was very much linked to locality, to village, to kinship, to clan networks, uh, and to religion. So there was no sense of, of you know, this abstract community the nation is, which requires a lot of uh, uh, knowledge, uh, requires some sort of a geographical understanding of maps, uh, you know, the nation is an abstract community, an imagined community in that sense, which requires high degree or relatively high degree of literacy, uniform standardized languages, all of these things that we know from Keller and Anderson and others. Uh, so what's important in here, uh, you know, the argument that I want to make is that nationalism was not even important that much for elites either. Uh, elites were not, they were split in terms of what they wanted to create, some wanted to recreate the Byzantine Empire in Greece and other territories, some wanted Russia to expand to these regions. Some were nationalist influenced by the French uh, tradition and so on and so forth. What's more important, I would argue, is, uh, is this uh, uh, what we would call a reactive mini imperialism, which at that time could rely and use categories of you know, discourses of practice that dominated, were present, they were visible, that people could relate to. So, Instead of opposing imperial model of governments, the new states tended to, you know, conjoin nationalist and imperial discourses and practices, initially much more imperial, later on, uh, you know, nation more nationalist. So this is a kind of immediately after, uh, in, in the early 19th century, we see Serbia, uh, you know, gaining autonomy in Bulgaria, Romania, uh, you know, in Greece, down there in the south, in the expense of Ottoman Empire. So if you look at each of these Balkan states, and I, I don't obviously have time to go over every of them, I'll just focus on Greece, uh, Bulgaria, and Serbia, uh, just to give you a sense of how this, this imperial heritage was invoked. So in, in, the, in a Greek sense, obviously Byzantine, Byzantine tradition and Byzantine empire was, was an empire, by definition, uh, was important uh, in claiming territories uh, which Byzantine Empire controlled, which obviously included a lot of what is today Turkey, uh, uh, then also invoking the religious tradition, claiming Eastern Orthodox believers to be Greeks, and obviously they were culturally very diverse, uh, but they were part of the Eastern Orthodox millet, which tended to be run by Greek uh, priests. Uh, so here we have a demographic claim uh, made uh, in order to expand territories, uh, and orthodoxy is more or less identified with Greek nationalism uh, in order to create a unified Greek national state. Then we have also a historical border claim uh, built in part on uh, empire, also in part on the previous heritage of Greek, of Hellenic or world, ancient Greece. Uh, and the idea was that these uh, historic border, uh, uh, borders and the demographic claims 
should be taken in, into account to create a future Greek state. So if you look at the, you know, so the notion that was used at that time is it was the Megali idea, the great idea, uh, which essentially was coined by, uh, it was coined much earlier, but uh, Yanis Kolekis, who became later prime minister, uh, articulated that idea and gave it the, the visibility <coughs> in, within the Greek nationalism. Uh, and you can see this was a, an imperial idea from the very beginning, more than a national idea, because it, you know, Kolekis uh, spoke about you know, creating the Greek state which would comprise two continents, Europe and Asia, and five seas. So this is all kind of within the Mediterranean. This is a very telling speech, if you look, that he gave in the Greek parliament when the Kingdom of Greece uh, was established. He said explicitly, the Kingdom of Greece is not Greece. Greece uh, constitutes only one part, the smallest and poorest. There are two main centers of Hellenism, Athens, the capital of the Greek Kingdom, and Constantinople, the dream and hope of all Greece. So you can see this is, again, national and imperial conjoined, uh, using these ethno-national uh, ideas but projecting them onto the much larger territory by using that heritage of the <coughs> imperial past. So and, and these are mini imperial projects, really. And this is a map of, of this Megali idea of the greater Greece, as envisaged by Greek nationalists, and still is used by many Greek uh, more radical nationalists. And as you can see, almost half of Turkey is there reclaimed in Cyprus and some parts of Bulgaria, uh, Macedonia, and uh, bits of Albania and so on. Uh, similar things we, we can find in, in the case of Bulgaria and Serbia, which uh, in, they both emphasize these past imperial glories, uh, in obviously invoking very different historical periods. So in, in the Bulgarian case, uh, there's a lot of reference to previous medieval empires, first Bulgarian empire, which was not uh, run by Slavic uh, uh, population. Uh, 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 but there is much more emphasis to the Second Bulgarian Empire, which was already the Slavicized. And especially, you know, the key ruler here, Simon the Great, from the 9th century, and lots of other rulers since him, Krum and Boris I, and even Asen II, and uh, others. Uh, so the focus in this nationalist narrative is on successes that have been achieved in this period of Christianization population, introduction of uh, uh, written code of law, uh, uh, creation of a semi-autonomous Bulgarian Eastern, Eastern Orthodox Church, adoption of uh, Syrian alphabet. So this again, this uh, conventional narrative. But what's important again here is that these national ideas were very much, uh, they uh, were <coughs> on top of the imperial ambition, imperial project, imperial heritage. So this is a map which you know, shows you what the Bulgarian Empire looked like at its peak under Simon the Great, and obviously from that uh, image you get a straight uh, you know, sense that this was an important state in, in that period of time. Uh, so, so that kind of invokes a certain sense of national imagination and expansion, expansionist politics and so on. And then what you see also that a lot of intellectuals in 19th century uh, politicians, military leaders, were kind of very much vetted to this idea of reviving the greater uh, Bulgaria. Let's go back to Simeon the Great. Uh, in, and that particularly was the case uh, uh, with the establishment of semi-independent Bulgaria in 1878, after the, uh, the, the Treaty of San Stefano, when Bulgaria did expand very quickly under the Russian uh, uh, which but that was not recognized by the Berlin Congress. So there's always nationalism. And Bulgarian nationalism always makes that claim. Since Stefan and so on. So what's important for us is not just that this is a nationalist thing, but it is much more of a mini imperialist thing. The medieval imperial legacy was deployed to uphold the nationalist project. And you see that also when Bulgarian first uh, the ruler was established to defend Bulgaria, Ferdinand I, he uh, used the term Tsar, Emperor. So he said he didn't uh, uh, you know positioned himself as a, as a ruler of a, some sort of a nation state. He positions himself as a ru ruler of an empire, uh, you know, and which was very much driven by that notion of great Bulgarian uh, uh, empire. So this is the uh, the first, and this is Simon the Great. As you can see, a lot of similarities, because he wanted to look very much like Simon the Great. He wanted to be a new Simon the Great. They have almost exactly the same beard, 
And uh, also, we don't obviously have a photograph. This is an invented image <laughs> of what the signal of the grid looked like. Uh, but it's an interesting thing. It was an image that was circulated, and um, you know, you, you, you get that sense of what the ambition was. In Serbia, again, a little bit more complicated story here because we have uh, two pretenders uh, for the throne, uh, you know, invoking the legacy of Nemanjic, the dynasty who well, founded the independent Serbian Orthodox Church in, in 1219. King Stefan's brother Rasko became saint later on, canonized as Saint Sala. He was ordained as the first archbishop. So here we have a degree of. Uh, Anthracephaly, although it is important to emphasize this was still had nothing to do with, with any ethnic concept, it was a very religious division. Uh, so the legacy of the Serbian Empire was important, particularly under the king, uh, the uh, Emperor Dushan, Dushan the Mighty, or uh, Stefan Rush IV. Uh, Dushan was his official name who ruled in the 14th century uh, for a fairly short period of time. So we have that image of uh, Dushan's emperor as this kind of great period of Serbian uh, imperial past. And then later on, when we encounter a uh, kind of nationalist articulation of Serbian idea, particularly under uh, uh, Ilya Grashenin, uh, who was an important politician uh, in, in the mid-19th uh, 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 century in Serbia, who formulated one of the ideas of greater Serbia, there were others that formulated that later on. He was very much influenced by that notion of invoking the past imperial legacies. So this is the Serbian Empire under uh, Dushan, uh, the mighty, and, and it was uh, kind of quite large, but it didn't really last a very long time. Uh, within Serbian uh, case, uh, as I mentioned, we had two dynasties who were competing uh, very much during the 19th century and early 20th century, viciously so with assassinations and everything else. Karadjordjevic and Obrenovic, uh, a family, and they were both leaders of the Serbian uprisings and were claiming that legacy of the past. Uh, so they often relied and used this pageantry, royal pageantry flag, a coat of arms, uh, invoking this, these images of uh, Tsar Dushan, Emperor Dushan, uh, you know, the yellow flag with the red two headed eagle that's still used in Serbia uh, was very much this imperial symbol. And they even made some sort of invented uh, 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 legacies that they are related uh, biologically to uh, the, the Nemanjic, which obviously was a great invention. But that was important for making that claim uh, for you know, being ruler of the new imperial state. Uh, the, the whole imperial project uh, gained momentum during the Balkan Wars when Serbia expanded substantially, uh, in, uh, especially after the Second Balkan War. And that you can see how nationalism was very much imperially driven towards expansion of the territory uh, in various directions and so on. So here we see the, the Serbian uh, images of Memories and that same Sala as well. So this is all imperial legacy. Uh, okay, so now we, we have that sense of uh, Balkans where uh, imperial and national were not uh, mutually exclusive. They very much were dependent on each other, and imperial things seem to be much stronger in the early times. The whole idea of greater uh, uh, Greece, greater Bulgaria, greater Serbia was built in that kind of imperial tradition. Now we'll take a look in Ireland, where a different concept was used. Instead of the emphasis on greatness, the emphasis was very much on smallness. Uh, being small uh, was not a geographical description or, or a description of population. It was also a, a particular nationalist claim, but it was framed differently. So, in, in, in Irish context, we have this notion of a small nation, or first of the small nations, which goes all the way back from a, a violent crashing of the 1798 uh, rebellion, uh, when Ireland was uh, framed very much as being occupied, dominated by this enormous, uh, powerful British Empire. Uh, and you could see that Lord Byron also expressed this very early on, uh, you know, talking about uh, the idea that Ireland was part of this union had nothing to do with the will of the people in, in, in Ireland, but it had more to do with the uh, kind of coercive power of the British state. As he put it, between a small nation and a great, between a conquered people and its conquered, there can be about the sham union, the union of the war constrictor with its great. So it's kind of very clear cut understanding of the two entities. And here obviously you can see image of the British Empire controlling really vast territories throughout the world uh, at that time. 
and uh, kind of being by far the most important empire in, in the late 19th, uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, controlling oceans and having yeah, large uh, uh, navy and things like that. The, this idea of national smallness uh, is uh, later on articulated further by a number of uh, Irish intellectuals and uh, uh, politicians and uh, other influential figures uh, and Young Ireland, obviously, which was influenced by uh, similar uh, nationalist movements in Europe, uh, Young Italy and Young Switzerland and so on. Uh, the Irish Republican Brotherhood uh, is, was also influential in kind of articulating that notion of Ireland being a small nation. So leading Young Irelander Thomas Davis uh, was one of the first who who defined Irish struggle for independence in terms of a small nation fighting this great empire. And this is uh, one of his poems, just from verse from one of his poems, where he compares Ireland to other uh, uh, subjugated and, or uh, relatively speaking, smaller nations in Europe at that time. Uh, so here you see the link how Austria is dominating Italy, essentially northern part of Italy, Austria, on Italy, the Roman Eagle chain. Bohemia, today's Czech Republic, Serbia, uh, Hungary, within her clutches grasp. So, and Ireland struggling, struggles gallantly, mingles, loosely in grasp. Uh, so that there's that kind of comparative context. If all these small nations in Ireland is one of them. Later on, we see similar uh, discourse present in political parties, particularly Sinn Féin being the kind of key uh, uh, voice of nationalism in Ireland. In, in that time, so 1915 uh, election manifesto, we have we see that song: the Spaniards, Bulgars, Swedes, and Danes have claims less high than we, yet suffer they know women's chains. Those nations can be free. So this idea that some were given, some small nations have rights to independence and others don't. Uh, so you know that, that kind of the moral argument that is invoked around that. Uh, after independence, the small nation discourse <coughs> continues. Uh, it's even reinforced. We see this in, in a 1922 uh, 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 report uh, uh, that was published in, in the Irish Parliament, uh, Dol Aaron, uh, where you see the kind of statement, no country ever started its international career with better prospects than were ours after the war, for our soldiers have won a sworn friendship everywhere and we had no enemies to speak off through the continent of Europe, Ireland had every reason to expect rapidly to become recognized as the first of the small nations. So this was a kind of almost a honorary title that was used from 1920s onwards, defining Ireland as being one of the first uh, to kind of uh, gain, a, 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 I mean, full independence, not, not completely at that time, it's only 1948 that they became fully independent, but still that sense of uh, Ireland could represent, could be a, an example to other future uh, nations, particularly nations in the third world, uh, which seek independence from these great powerful mm -hmm. empires like the British, French, and others. Also, Emmanuel de Valera, Irish president, makes the reference as well uh, in one of his speeches, as you can see here, even as a partition small nation, we shall go on to strive to play our part in the world, continuing to work for the cause of freedom. Uh, for peace and understanding between all nations. Uh, we, we have a, 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 you know, lots of these discourses being used later on in, in a speech by uh, uh, President Kennedy when he visited Ireland in 1963. He also uses exactly the same phrase, Ireland is the first of the small nations. Again, Ireland is an example to other small nations uh, in order to inspire others to act in a similar way to seek freedom and independence. Okay, so now I want to question this. <laughs> so, if you look at Ireland, you know, kind of in, in, in terms of what it was like uh, in 19th century, particularly early 19th century, you get a sense that this was not a small nation. Uh, in terms of population, Ireland before famine was a very large, very highly dense uh, island, uh, which in the uh, you know, 1840s reached about 8.5 million people, which at that time was a really big number, a lot of people. If you compare Ireland to smaller uh, nations, small nation states, at that time, you see that they are all much smaller. Belgium, 4 million, Netherlands, 3 million, Sweden, 3 million, Norway, uh, Denmark, Finland, about 1.5 million, Portugal, 3.7 million. So Ireland was much closer to these larger states in Europe at that time 
you know, the largest was Spain, England, and Austria, and, and they were enormous uh, states, really, particularly England and Austria. Uh, uh, you know, imperials, uh, they still had imperial structures in place in Spain, did to some extent as well. Uh, so Ireland was really far ahead of any of these small nations. It was at least medium-sized uh, entity, but in many respects it was a large entity in terms of population. But what's also more important in terms of influence. Uh, so uh, here we have a link with the imperial uh, heritage. So link is not explicit, link is not symbolic, as it is the case with uh, Balkan states, which you know kind of involve these uh, dreams of the past empires that existed a thousand years ago. In Irish case, a link with the empire is, is much more direct, even though it's denied, uh, particularly after independence. So Irish population was very much part of the imperial project, with Irish settlers, traders, administrators, and soldiers uh, often acting and fighting uh, uh, for the British Empire. Uh, and for example, if you look at some, I have lots of evidence for this in, in the book, but if you look 1825, 1850, half the European soldiers of the East India Company, Bengal Army, which was enormous, were from Ireland, many of whom were cut. So in a sense, a lo lot of Irish soldiers fought for British, particularly in the First World War, they, many of them died and then they were forgotten, now they, they've been commemorated uh, uh, more recently and, and so on. Irish uh, were also very much uh, part of, uh, there were more Irishmen than Englishmen in the British Army uh, at one point. Most of them were Protestant, but still a substantial number of Catholic uh, soldiers as well. So uh, this, this is a very strong link with the Imperial project. In a military context, there is a very strong link in the, uh, uh, with the economy. Ireland was part of, as a part of the British Empire, was integrated with the world economy. Uh, uh, Britain was at the helm of the world economy, was the you know, largest trading empire, and in that sense, Ireland uh, cities, Irish cities, were particularly Belfast and Dublin, were, were the key kind of catalyst of that project. Dublin was the second uh, important city in the empire for many years. Uh, next the thing is an ideological influence. Here we have a very strong, perhaps even the most visible impact. In that was the Irish clergy was part of the civilizing mission, which is the core of any empire. And uh, you know, Irish priests and Irish missions were sent all over the world to, to influence and convert uh, native population in Africa and other places. Uh, so, so in a sense, there is a strong, very strong imperial legacy here, which is obviously later uh, largely uh, became less visible or denied. Uh, Dublin, as I mentioned, Belfast, and to some extent Cork, were important centers of trade, industry, and manufacturing. Uh, uh, Belfast, I think, was obviously a key city at the end of the 19th century, 20th century, building, you know, shipbuilding, Titanic, and was built there and was a very uh, prosperous place, uh, uh, you know, very, in, in many respects. Uh, railroad system is also interesting because it, uh, when it started, you know, it started slowly, as you can see here, for 65 miles of track in 1845, but by the 1914, the uh, whole of Ireland was covered. So this was uh, one of the most developed uh, uh, railway network in, in the world. And you can see this image now of, of Ireland. Obviously, these are the early trains which we don't use today, but if you travel to, to small villages, to different parts of Ireland, you still find these rail, rail tracks all over Ireland, which is very unusual when you see you know, this kind of infrastructural capacity that existed in Ireland, which wasn't present in other parts of, of, uh, of Europe at that time at all. So what, what I want to argue here as a conclusion <laughs> is to, uh, that we challenge these kind of simplified uh, dichotomies, empire versus nation state, as they have and they don't have anything in common, nationalism versus imperialism as being completely separate, mutually exclusive ideologies. Uh, and then we take these uh, kind of uh, concepts such as small nation, great nation, uh, uh, not as descriptive and innocent uh, 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 concepts that are deployed, terms that are deployed to describe reality, but they are actually often very much part of a strategy, political strategy, to frame certain national aspirations, uh, political goals. So categories such as small nation, great nation, greater nation are very much context dependent. They cannot be taken at face, face value. We have to take them with a pinch of salt. 
uh, they require unpacking historical analysis, sociological interpretation, what they actually mean at that time, how they change, how they are reinforced, how they are used, deployed. Uh, uh, you know, in a sense, they, there is a political meaning attached to the terms we use. So in that context, if you look at the Balkan and Irish uh, cases, what we see, uh, some similarities and some differences. Uh, difference, obviously, is that in, 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 in the Balkan case, there is a lot of emphasis on this greatness, you know, past greatness, uh, building these enormous states in the future, invoking the imperial past. In Irish case, the, the focus is on smallness, making yourself much smaller than you actually are, because the empire next to you is, you know, this great, powerful empire. So you have to be small and, 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 and unimportant and, and victim and, and everything else. Uh, so, and, uh, so I think there is a, a degree of ideological equivalency here between the concept of national smallness and the concept of national greatness, because they all serve similar purpose, uh, you know, for nationalist movements, political movements. So just as the rulers of Balkan states involved this uh, glory, superior past to project the future expansion of their their states, which were not uh, kind of uh, which were very fledgling states, small uh, and, and not very influential. The Irish nationalist movements use the category of smallness to justify their own their political ambitions. So what we see here, what is also one of the important differences, is that uh, Ireland uh, had a very nationalized population. So the literacy rates were very high already in the early 19th century, about 90 percent. Early 20th century, about 90 percent. While Balkan states had a very low literacy rates. Uh, so they, they gained independence. You had a political independence. You had a state, but you didn't have a nation. In, in, as a sociological concept. Well, in Irish case, you have a nation, you had a very nationalized population, but you didn't have a state. So the focus was really on gaining ownership of the state. And in that context, presenting yourself as a small, as a victim, was much more important, much better strategy than invoking some sort of past uh, glories, which was the case in the Balkans. Okay, so I'll stop here now, and we can have maybe time for questions and discussion. Nationalism is a more nation state today than ever before. Even entities that were not 
that they were essentially city states like Singapore or Andorra frame themselves as a nation state because we live in a world of nation states. So as long as we have nation states, nationalism will always be there uh, and could be invoked. So it is, I mean, what's happening now in terms of the far right uh, uh, and explosions is, is not a surprise to people who study nationalism. Because if you look at the Eurobarometer Euro surveys, nationalist attitudes have been really rising over the last 30 years in Europe. And that's also the case in other parts of the world. So I don't have a good news in that respect. <laughs> Thank you for your very interesting lecture. It's, it's very interesting to see that the concept of smallness in relation to Ireland, but also I've never seen the comparison between the figures of 8.5 million which, uh, with other countries in terms of size. But of course, the, the turning point in this is the Great Famine in 1845 where you move from <coughs> what was clearly there, a large country, into a smaller country in the second half of the 19th century, and also a, clearly a, a downward movement where you have one million people dying in famine and then one million emigrating and then significant amounts of immigration after that. Um, so I think that maybe the, there's a, sure. a difference there in the second half of the, the, the century. But, uh, and we didn't mention it, but of course some of this was taken up by John Lennon at the start of the 20th century, where it's justifying you know, uh, the legitimacy of Irish uh, semi independence, where we would be good partners with the British and the Empire. Um, but some of this was, was true, of course, uh, force of circumstance, where you had a great family, there was no employment in Ireland, so one of the few opportunities was to join the British Army. And the British Empire didn't want those soldiers based in Ireland, so they actually sent them to India. It wasn't a choice either to join the British Army or to go to India for a great part of those uh, people. Um, so I think it, it starts off perhaps in there as, as certainly a larger country, but then that concept of smallness perhaps becomes more legitimate. Just that. No, it's a good point in a sense, and I do, do make that point in the book in a sense. So there's more information, there's more kind of evidence. In so, so you're pretty right about that. But what I wanted to emphasize is that you know, often this is projected much more into the past. The Ireland has always been small. And I'm saying, you know, you know, if you look at these objective uh, uh, criteria, it wasn't really small. Things have changed very much after the famine. You know, population has shrunk. As I said, a million people died, a million immigrated, and then people continued immigrating. So Ireland became much, much smaller in terms of population. But what's also important, is, uh, so it's not only population, it's also its presence within these networks that the empire provided. So this is not to say that you know population was not kind of uh, suffered. Obviously they did, the majority of people they did. But you know some groups were obviously part of the imperial project, you know, one way or another, some feeling, some unfeeling, as we say rightly, but they were still there in a sense. Uh, so what I would say is a lot of the nationalists started after the, the independence wanted to kind of airbrush that, you know, as you know, this is not part of our history. Now that has changed, obviously in the first war and everything else. But you're right, that changes. So I'm not saying that after this period, Ireland is not small in many respects, it is. But what's interesting for me is this kind of the, the, the use of smallness as, as a concept, you know, ideological concept to make a certain statement. Uh, and that's not the case, let's say, in a, but, uh, if you look at the figures that I gave there, often states were tiny in that period, some hundred million people. Uh, you know, <laughs> and they were projecting this idea of greatness. So that's, that's an interesting thing, why these things happen, why we use these concepts now. So, uh, so that's why I said, you know, first of all, the small nations is not only about smallness, it's also about being first, being kind of an example to others. So, so that's it. Uh, but you're right. <laughs> it's uh, very interesting about this question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk more about how these two discourses maybe interact, because in the Balkans you have this mm -hmm. idea of greatness from the 12th century, plus this idea of a small nation fighting against the gigantic Ottoman Empire and the centuries of being under the yoke of the Ottomans. Mm -hmm. So you have two coexisting areas of smallness and of yeah. greatness. Can you, you talk you do, about yeah, that? You're right. In a sense, again, these are not uh, uniform ways of how nationalism operates. So they are different uh, nationalist projects and they are competing. They are often uh, mutually exclusive. So in a sense, you're right. You walk know, that sense. I mean, even today, we could say in Serbian nationalism, we have that sense we are a small nation, we, we fought Americans, we fought Germans in the Second World War, and we survived, we fought in the First World War, defeated uh, Austrians and, uh, and everything else. So there's that idea of being small victim, but on the, on the other hand, still using that sense of that we used to be a big empire, and we should be a big empire, in a sense. So that was the kind of discourse of the 19th century, we are small, we are emerging, 
you know, which you see also in the, in the Coetus' formulation, this is not a Greece. You know, this is an element of Greece. We, 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 we used to be much bigger and we will be much bigger. So in a sense, there is, a, uh, I think, an ambiguity in that sense. There is the, the recognition we, we might be now small, although that may not be uh, uh, often explicitly stated. Sometimes it is in, in a particular context. So it is a context-dependent category. But the idea is, you know, our, our, we, 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 we aspire to be great. We, we have been great. We will be great, in, both in terms of size and in terms of symbolic. So you're right. You know, there is that element. Too. But what's interesting for Irish case, again, that the notion of greatness, uh, in that sense, never really fully developed. Although you could say, I mean, hypothetically, why Irish nationalism really never developed the idea of greater Ireland, which could include Wales or Scotland, you know, kind of the Celtic uh, element, which you might have, you know, in Serbian nationalism, or in that sense, but that didn't happen. I mean, you could say in part because it's an island, but that didn't stop Greece with islands. So, <laughs> so why there has never been a greater Irish nationalism? But it, it could have been. Why not? I mean, there is a, you know, you could build these narratives. So it is an interesting thing why this did not happen in Irish case, and it did happen in uh, nearly every Balkan or state. Okay. <laughs> yes. And can you maybe comment on Slo the case of Slovenia? Because Croatia, we can see that it's some, I mean, you could say similar to Serbia in terms of this millennial um, wish for statehood that was finally achieved in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. So you could see that combination. But what about Slovenia? Yeah. No, you know, I'm allowed to say I don't really know that much about Slovenia uh, in the whole kind of historical heritage. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I mentioned there, you know, that there's the idea of greater Slovenia that did, so maybe it wasn't as prominent as it was with these entities. And I mean, obviously, there was a great Croatia before uh, the Second World War, you know, with the, the Starcic and others who did advocate that idea that everybody who speaks this language <laughs> is a crowd. So the ambition that Croatia would. You know, it, it develops much later than in, than in, in, in the politics of local states. In, I'm not sure, maybe Rob can say maybe more about that. The, the, there's some this in the end, in various free groups of the far right, mm -hmm. claiming the Kaikarian speakers as sleeping for example, who, by the way, in the 16th, 17th century, did identify as sleeping, but not in the modern sense. Mm -hmm. so you can find documents uh, and you can integrate them in, in this narrative. But, uh, I mean, as much as the Slovenian historiography is nationalist, was and still is, to an extent, this idea was not that prominent. No, no, I would say that the, the, the idea of smallness is, is more prominent uh, in, in this case. More of course, on the smart, smart reality child. <laughs> 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 that, that's one of those, yeah. Okay, yeah, for example. Yeah. I think the idea, the idea of smallness is very much present since the 19th, early 19th mm -hmm. century. It was also present in the years before the independence. Mm -hmm. The song of Agro, of Samo Milion Nasir. Yeah. Yeah. Samo Milion Nasir, Maiken Narod Vidno Kriu, Ya Chesi Maiken Si Vidno Kriu. It was it's actually it's the only song from this band that was not a parody of anything. It's the only normal song that mm -hmm. they produced, actually, can be listened. So it was yeah. actually serious. They were serious about it. And I, I really think that. I, I really think that we should reconsider this idea of smallness and Slovenian, Slovenian identity and uh, Slovenian identification once more because it was very interesting how it fits. Uh, it, it, it doesn't quite fit in this, this idea of the, the, uh, the, the Zag I've seen today, thank you for this lecture, but with this idea of this greatness, it was not greatness and smallness of one nation and smallness and greatness of Ireland. Mm. I think Slovenia is here again a case that cannot fit this. Uh, this uh, an but uh, definitely small ones. Sure. Okay. Uh, I wonder if you could perhaps say something about the implications for minorities and for diversity. Because in the context of Slovenia, I look at some of the language policies that were always framed in the context of Slovenian smallness, but language policies were always exclusive in a way, depending on who the other was. And then in this context of greatness and smallness and nation building, and particularly exclusive nation building, perhaps if you could say a few words about the implications. Yes. It is interesting because in the 19th century, uh, you, you have again a very competing uh, interpretation uh, what you know, how wide is the concept of being a Serb or Bulgarian or a Greek? And, and sometimes it's very uh, inclusive. You know, anybody who is a, I mean, relatively speaking, also obviously religion played an important element. 
there. Uh, but if you look at the, let's say, Great, Greater Croatia or Star Church, uh, even though today uh, his heritage is used by far right in Croatia, if you read his, his writings, they're very inclusive in the sense that he's not opposed to you know, the, the diversity or Orthodox Muslim and Catholic. So he, he's more in line with the kind of liberal nationalism of uh, mid 19th century in Europe. Uh, that changed later on, you know, after the, at the end of the 19th century, the century and the big ones of these kind of racist, the much more uh, ethnic concepts of, of nationalism. Uh, you know, the, these the great uh, uh, Serbia, great uh, Bulgaria project, blah, 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 they became much more exclusive. So since they, there was no room for Jews, there was no room for any diversity of Muslims or anything like that. So I wonder whether this is also the case in uh, in, you know, in, in the same period with the notion of smallness, and it certainly is for some state. You know, in a sense, we are small, but we are pure. We are, you know, this is who we are, and there is no place for, for others. Uh, I don't know, I mean, I, Irish context is more different uh, because obviously, before Ireland became independent, uh, these categories were not used, we, you know, Irish nationalists were not exclusive in the sense that, you know, although capitalism was an important part of being Irish. Uh, a lot of leaders of uh, Irish nationalist movement were Protestants itself. Those who revived the language, Irish language, but many of them were Protestants. So in a sense, the, the, you know, this became much more, uh, much stronger after independence, particularly in Northern Ireland, when this uh, essentially became a sectarian conflict. Which it wasn't until that period. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to refer to what has been said that uh, mm. the idea of smallness is very mm. present in Slovenia and mm. South imagination throughout the history, but it is also part of the um, of the politics of today. Mm. The way Slovenia is conceptualizing foreign uh, uh, its foreign policy, how it behaves in the context of the European Union, I think it's very much. Um, inspired by this idea we are small, thus we are victim, but, but also we, we are not we, it's somehow uh, exculpating uh, uh, taking guilt uh, off from the country of um, for instance dealing how to deal with the uh, migration crisis. Well, we are small, we can't do anything about it even though Slovenia is on the route of on the migrant route and could uh, uh, have a, a different policy or um, had, had a say. Uh, so I I was wondering how these concepts of smallness and, and greatness, uh, how do you see them operating today in, mm -hmm. in today's uh, uh, everyday politics and political yeah. imagination? Yes, yeah, so, so they could obviously, they, again, depending on which situation. You know, and I'm sure that uh, I, I, I haven't used them you know, every time, but I think that you could use them very well. It, you know, and then they are contradictory. So you know, obviously, uh, unlike Ireland, which used that before, we used that notion small, smallness also in terms of we are impoverished versus Britain, which is very, you know, economically powerful and exploited and everything else. Uh, in Slovenia, this could not, you know, that discourse could not exist. So any discourse was, we are, we are, you know, developed, much more developed than the rest of the, uh, of Yugoslavia. So, so there is this element of superiority. We, we, we have all these things. But then, when you say, in, in the context of refugees, we, we cannot, you know, we are small, we cannot want it. And so there is a little bit of contradic contradiction there, I think. It would be interesting to see for each yeah. individual case how this would work, you know, how these, uh, in some instances you have that, you know, the, the, the both concepts could be deployed in other instances they, they wouldn't work. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. From everything that you presented today and how we now talk about it, it seems that these concepts are not consistent mm -hmm. and that their function is not to be consistent and that they are really well thought through ideas. There are more political strategies or uh, political discourse that is very usable for certain moments. Yeah, no, no, you're right. In a sense, that's what I emphasized initially. They, they are ambiguous. And then, you know, as all ideological uh, uh, projects, they have to be ambiguous because they, they can be used differently time frames in, in different contexts. Uh, I start this in the book when I do, I start with the, because once I think in, in, a, in a social science of a small nation was really deployed by a Czech historian Miroslav Prok in the 80s. You know, he used that, you know, he said, you know, we, we can analyze these distinct entities which are small nations, which are small nations, and then he analyzed the regions and the Serbs and the Croats and the Slovenes and Czechs and uh, Irish and, and all that. So, so there is that kind of old tradition of a small nation which simply assumes you know, this is a given thing. 
because mm -hmm. they are small, they're very different from these large nations. Uh, and uh, but when you kind of dig a little bit, you find out this is not really how things are. That's what I want. I want to a way to undermine a bit of that. Uh, but you're right, it's not, you know, these are deliberately ambiguous and they mm -hmm. change. Thanks. I've been interested uh, in hearing more about how the region ties into the comparisons. Because you recently reviewed work of uh, Ascari's Peter Melvis, mm -hmm. Orthodoxy and Nationalism. And uh, of course, um, nationalism in the Balkans basically instrumentalized uh, the Catholic Church and the uh, idea yeah, of the Sephardi. Many of them study in, in Western Europe, so they you know, imbibe a lot of the ideas there. But at the same time, they grew up in the Orthodox milieu, they grew up in the nationalism in in Ireland, in Cathedral, and all mm -hmm. those small countries, it's of a different quality to this. Yeah, yeah I mean, you could say that the religion uh, was an important uh, cultural marker rather than really genuine belief system. You, you, you know, what you end up with in Northern Ireland, and this conflict between unionists and nationalists, uh, it's not really about religious, genuine religious differences. It's the religion was, was used as a cultural marker of, Difference, an identity marker, which you could say the same thing has happened in the Bosnian case. And I think there are, uh, there are some similarities that respect that you could, uh, you could uh, utilize the, this whole idea of uh, orthodoxy in, in the context of Bulgaria and Greece and Serbia and others, uh, as you could use the idea of Catholicism in, in, in an Irish context. Although I think that the story is a little bit more complicated. You know, initially, uh, was not kind of very straightforward. As I mentioned, this example the, that uh, uh, Irish nationalism was not really sectarian in the 19th century. Uh, the first uprising was very much brought home done by Protestants. And we had a lot of kind of Irish Protestants who saw themselves as Irish and were opposed to, to kind of imperial influence from London. So they essentially wanted an autonomy very early on. Along the lines of the British, they, they, what Americans did later on. You know, so when the American Revolution happened, it happened not because Americans wanted some sort of new republic. Uh, it's because they, 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 they saw themselves as the genuine British citizen you know, who couldn't pay tax. So it says, even in that context, these, these cultural differences are not important at the moment when these things happened, but they became much more important after independence. And I think this is also interesting in what I, you know, what I keep to me, this is really good in that respect of uh, you know, kind of differentiating how uh, orthodoxy uh, operated before the age of, of nationalism, because in, before the establishment of nation states, when it was not really, it was quite universalist as a belief system, as an everyday practice, and then once the nation states are established, it, 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 it was largely instrument, instrumentalized by the state themselves. So you become, you know, the autocephaly becomes national thing. Before that, it was not the nationalist. And now, uh, a lot of churches in, the, in this part of the world are very nationalist, maybe leadership you know, sort of churches. So you could say that you know, religion was important, but more as a this cultural marker which can be criticized, you know, mostly after independence. I don't know if that answers. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just have a small question here on uh, so like, yeah, like just talking about Irish small, uh, small kind of nationalism in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so like Ireland was like it has like a small history on kind of protectionism, mm -hmm. like uh, not long after independence. Mm -hmm. And uh, even kind of today, you still see some fringe parties, yeah, like small kind of far right fringe parties, uh, still kind of calling for this form of protectionism again, which didn't mm -hmm. work out. Uh, would you still say that there's like a uh, link between this kind of nas uh, smallest nationalism and these ideas of protectionism and isolationism mm -hmm. within Ireland today and kind of yeah, I mean, I, 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 within com um, co conversations today? Yeah, no, I, I think this, this was obviously an important protection was, was part of the official policy after independence for a number of years until it was recognized in doesn't work, it's economically counterproductive, and, and then these policies change dramatically. And I think, uh, you know, these policies and these ideas might still be present, so you're actually, it's on the margins, it's not, you know, I, 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 there's a, a recognition in, in Ireland that, you know, this hasn't worked, and Ireland's benefited economically, culturally, politically from being integrated in the European Union, and, yeah. you know, so I, 
I think Irish nationalism has transformed in that context. Before it was, uh, it's interesting, obviously, during the uh, Celtic Tiger era, you know, how the smallness was uh, re re reframed, and I talk about this in the book as well, along the lines of the same small tigers like Singapore and, you know, other states. So we, we might be small, but we are economically very su su successful and superior. So there was a, perhaps for the first time that sense of superiority was developed, which may reappear now after Brexit in a, some kind of positive way, <laughs> because Ireland for the first time has upper hand over Britain, at least for, for a while. And so, you know, I, I don't think that there is that sense of, you know, that there might be only a small number of people who, who are isolationists or kind of, yeah. uh, I, I don't think that's mainstream. From Ashania. Jimmy, the moment of future, Sidney Shah, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. From our son, Kuala Zalbisk, Kulam Salah, Kushenka, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for supporting this uh, lecture. The state of the day is the same as the people who are in the world.